right, we are live again for another reading from my 2011 book, Reason Fulfilled by Revelation, the 1930s Christian Philosophy Debates in France. As always, we'll do some reading, and then after that, we'll have some time for Q&A and discussion with whatever people put into the chat. Uh, do try to make it relevant to the book, the topic, the thinkers, and the issues that are being discussed. Um, we have AMA sessions for more general questions or things like that. So I'm um, about halfway through. Emile Brehier's um, contribution to the debates, which is his article, Is There a Christian Philosophy from the Revue de Metaphysique et de la Morale in 1931? This is one of the early pieces in the debate. And it's good to remind ourselves that Brehier was also a young, up and coming historian of philosophy at the time. The original debate was supposed to be uh, Brehier and Brunschwig versus Gilson and Maritain, and then a lot of other people jumped into it. And Brehier represents what we typically call the rationalist set of positions on Christian philosophy. I'll also mention that the whole thrust of Brehier's position, as we will see at the end of this piece, is to say that there is no such thing as Christian philosophy because it couldn't possibly exist. Um, so I'm picking up here at section three of his article, Is There a Christian Philosophy? In the works of its great metaphysicians, Descartes, Malbranche, Leibniz, the 17th century shows us a completely new attempt at synthesis between philosophy and Christianity. To speak truly, historians of philosophy up to the 20th century had almost completely neglected the religious aspects of these doctrines. Granted, everyone knows that Descartes personally had a living faith, and the truths of faith remain, as he says, first in his belief. But this faith, like that of Montaigne, seems to be entirely custom and habitude. It is juxtaposed to a philosophy that itself is rational and grounded on a universal method. For nearly 20 years, more scrupulous and more detailed historical research has transformed somewhat the perspective in which these great systems appeared. Rationalism's being directed towards a Christian meaning corresponds to that general movement of minds that, beginning with the Counter-Reformation and the Council of Trent, adopts the counterposition, uh, contre-pied, to the Renaissance in the question of the relations of philosophy and faith. Throughout the, 16th, the entire 16th century, we see that thought oscillate between two opposed positions, an anti-Christian rationalism or an anti-rationalist Christian faith. On the one side of the Paduans, according to whom the Arist Aristotelian philosophy for them representing independent reason arrives on the most important questions, notably on immortality of the soul or the possibility of miracles, at results opposed to Christianity. On the other side, a Montaigne, for whom reason is powerless to affirm anything or deny anything with certainty. It cannot be an enemy or an aid for religion. It is too weak for that. Both parties agree to completely separate philosophical thought from religion, at one ending up in a rational construction incompatible with religion, the other being unable to see a serious opponent in feeble reason. In the 17th century, everything changes. Then, devoted humanism, studied by the Abbe Bremont in L'Histoire du Sentiment Religieux au uh, XVIIe siècle, brings itself forth. In this synthesis of faith and rationalism, Christians claim to turn on the libertines, the very weapon they'd used against religion, that is, reason. They wanted reason, consulted impartial, impartially, to end up establishing not, of course, Christianity's mysteries, which can only be revealed, but at least its fundamental truths, the existence of an infinite and creator God, and the immortality of the soul. It is then that this quite new campaign against the libertines 
begins in which one agrees with them in order to exalt reason's power, but diverges completely uh, from them in, in one's conclusions. Montaigne's skepticism appeared then just as much to be feared as the atheist's rationalism. Would it be true, as frequent attempts have been made to demonstrate in recent years, that Descartes meditations themselves fit into the current of Christian rationalism and that they should be a manifestation of it or even a manifesto? It is certain that Descartes does everything to emphasize in the eyes of the public and above all the theologians, his philosophy's Christian character. Do we therefore see then the birth of this Christian philosophy whose existence we are seeking? That was not the opinion of certain contemporaries of Descartes, and not the least important of them. Pascal reproached the proofs Descartes gives of the existence of God with being sterile and useless for the only thing that matters to the Christian religion, for salvation. As an apologist, Pascal encountered on his way this rationalist apologetic, which was imputed to Descartes, and this is what he thought. Quote, the metaphysical proofs of God's existence are so remote from the reasoning of men and so complicated that they make little impression. If they should be of service to some, it would be only in the moment that they see such demonstration, but an hour afterwards they fear they have been mistaken. He attacks not the truth of these proofs, but their opportuneness. Descartes and those whom he followed overestimate the condition of human nature by making reason the introduction to faith. But supposing that because of rational proofs, the conviction of God's existence can be firm in us, does it follow that the philosophy that employs them leads to Christianity? Christianity is the belief in a mediator and redeemer Christ and the knowledge of God without Christ, Pascal thinks, is a knowledge of pure curiosity and useless to salvation. Quod curiositate cognoverunt superbia amiserunt. This is the result of the knowledge of God obtained without Jesus Christ. It is communion without a mediator with the God whom they've known without a media, mediator. History shows Pascal to have been right here. Descartes' metaphysics goes in the direction of what has been called natural religion, that is the totality of truths that man can acquire about God and the soul by reason. This natural religion, common to all men, independent of any positive or revealed religion, leads so little onto the path to Christianity that it becomes a weapon for fighting against it in the 18th century. The necessity of a mediator, who is Christ, of a revelation, of a church that guards the deposit of that revelation, this is what Jean-Jacques Rousseau declares useless when he writes in the Profession de Foi du Vicaire Savoyard, what men between God and myself? Should we not have to see here the Cartesian point of view's normal culmination if we recall how he arrives at God after having excluded by methodological doubt everything other than his own thought? This would be a setback if Descartes' goal was truly to support Christianity, but it is not that. To make apologetics, Descartes' goal is to forget that metaphysics is part of a vaster philosophy completely oriented towards physics and morals. This would be to reduce the meditations to the proportions of a treatise like that of Father Mersenne against the impiety of the atheists and deists. There again, Pascal has seen the truth. Quote, I cannot forgive Descartes in all his philosophy. He would have been quite willing to dispense with God but he had to make him give a Philip to set the world in motion. Beyond this, he has no further need of God. In Descartes' works, theology has the place that it's assigned to it by method, and it is by accident that it is served for the propagation of the Christian religion. But this rationalism, is it not Christian, at least in the Thomist sense, that is, in the sense that it is ready to accept revealed theology censorship? Did Descartes not have the same opinion as St. Thomas on the relations between reason and faith? Did he not seek to demonstrate, for example, that his theory of matter is not in disagreement with the dogma of the real presence? This agreement, in principle, with Thomism cannot, however, go very far. So different are the conceptions of reason in the two doctrines. To a reason that reaches only the abstractions of sensible things, that discusses and argues more than it demonstrates, Descartes opposes a reason both intuitive and demonstrative. 
It has its own object, completely distinct from sensible things. Even more, it is capable of discovering truths, not only discussing theses. So understood, reason has a perfect autonomy. It is a source of certainty by itself. It is not at all that weak, obscure reason only disengaged slightly from sensations, which would have to fold before revelation. It is incontestable that this Cartesian reason is the one animating Spinoza's and Malbranche's doctrines. Assuredly, both have quite tangled relations with Christianity. Still, it is enough that they accept at their starting point the principle of clear and distinct ideas in order for them not to merit any more than the Cartesian philosophy, the name of Christian philosophy. In summary, Thomism and Cartesianism show us the two ways that Christian rationalism could take, ways that end up nowhere. Either, as in Thomism's case, a censure of authority and revelation is enforced and it is only through experience and being disciplined that one finds the place of reason, this puts rationalism in a more than precarious situation and at the limit annihilates it. Or, as in Descartes' case, it is a matter of a rationalism that decisively sets the conditions of certainty of a reason having in itself the intrinsic proof of its own truth. And then faith censorship no longer has any kind of meaning, so much that it is meaningless to call it Christian rationalism. All right, now we move on to section four of Brehier's Is There a Christian Philosophy? In the 18th century, when one says philosophy, one says anti-Christianism, and later Lamine designates by the word philosophism every doctrine that rejects revelation as a source of certainty. The theologians, for their part, stop looking for a support in truths of religious order in the natural light. It is not necessary for our purpose, wrote Paley, for example, in 1802, with respect to the immortality of the soul, that these propositions be susceptible of proof, or even that by the assistance of arguments drawn by the natural light they could go beyond the probable. It is sufficient that we can say they are not so improbable that one ought to reject on first examination the propositions or the facts united to them. Also, the Christian philosophy born in the 19th century in intimate relations with the assaults the preceding century's doctrines underwent is no longer the rationalism of the 13th or 17th century. They now attempt a fusion between reason and faith more intimate than in other times. It is in faith itself that the means by which reality represents itself are sought. This state of mind has, since the end of the 18th century, especially in France and Germany, so numerous and so varied expressions, we cannot dream of even following out its main currents. Let us indicate at least two great divisions that will allow introducing a bit of order into this confusion. Sometimes Christianity takes on the aspect of a social bond, the only one capable by its divine origin of disciplining human nature and creating the fundamental institutions that produce humanity. And at other times, it takes on the aspect of a revelation of the entire history of the universe the only revelation capable of giving our life a meaning and an orientation. In both cases, what is striking is the architectonic, systematic, constructive character that one lends Christianity by opposition to the anarchic freedom vaunted by the century of the revolution. Here, this is a completely new way of seeing things. It is no longer a question of divvying out truths of two orders in Christianity, those accessible to reason and those that are not. One grasps in it in its concrete totality as a living faith and as one speculative and practical, capable of directing intellects and wills. Let us consider now the first aspect in the words and the works of a demised, a debonald, a lamine. Everywhere, the philosophy of the 18th century sees a human work, an autonomous construction modifiable by rational means. These thinkers see a divine work as necessary as it is incomprehensible to reason. Whence the feeling of an absolute fact, of experience that one cannot analyze, a trait that gives to certain of demised passages, a character of fidelity to data, to positivity, which Christian philosophy of the 19th century shields itself. Politics, he says, for example, quote, 
presents a rather strange phenomenon, quite apt to make any wise man call to the administration of states tremble. It is that nearly everything that common sense perceives at the start in this science as an evident truth is almost always found, once experience has spoken, to be not only false, but detrimental, to begin with the most basic. If ever one has heard discussions about government and men being called to deliberate, for example, about hereditary or elective monarchy, one would regard a person who would determine themselves for the former as senseless. History, however, which is experimental politics, demonstrates that hereditary monarchy is the most stable, the most fortunate, the most natural to man. One perceives the close link between this Christian thought and a conservative politics that sees in the very duration of a constitution the witness of an origin independent of human will. If the base is purely human, says Joseph de Meist again, the edifice cannot hold, and the more that human affairs are mixed up in it, the more they engage in deliberation about science and writings especially, the more fragile the institution will be. If reason still retains some value, it is under the condition of not wanting to be anything other than a form of tradition and its oldest aspect. This Christian philosophy, the better to dominate reason, annexes it thus into revelation. It is de Bonald who assures that the former is only a species of the second. Reason, he says, is impossible without communication of beings with each other, without society, and this communication is in its turn impossible without language. But according to him, the absurdity of assumptions one would have to make if one thinks language is a human invention shows it would have to be revealed by God to man and with it the reason it contains. In such doctrines, Religion divinely revealed passes more and more for having that character of universality and unity that was formerly conferred on reason. According to La Monet, reason left to itself would end up only in skepticism, and it divides people. To the contrary, there has been only one single religion that presented itself under three forms, progressing from one to the other, that of the patriarchs, that of Moses, and that of Christ, and the pagan religions were only deformations of this unique revelation. For the early Lamanet, the main concern is absorbing all of humanity's powers into religion, the rift between Christianity and science, a rift for which he does not hesitate to hold responsible the clergy who confuse the errors of a radically atheist philosophy with what was right and pure in the cause they upheld, appears to him one of the most important reasons for the weakening of re religion in France. One sees how Christian philosophy of this kind is born from the conviction that Christianity alone responds to demands everyone felt after the revolutionary torment for unity, for organization, for fixity. This substitution of the Catholicity of Christianity for the universality of reason doesn't respond to some true reality. Let us muse about the evolution of Lamine himself, who instructed by experience saw little by little the unity he dreamed of unravel. For him, as for all the thinkers of his party, Christianity is not a speculative doctrine, but a historical reality, a church governed by the papacy. So he asks in the Affaire de Rome, what became in France and Germany and Poland even of the power that it exercised over minds at other times? Has it modified opinion there in some way, moved the public conscience? Forget the cliques and their miseries. Look to the masses. Where are those who the papacy directs and moves? By the demands of his thought and his action, Lamine is thus pushed out of an unresponsive Christianity, to historical Christianity, to Catholicism that abandons its mission, to Protestantism, an illegitimate and consequent narrow system. He opposes an ideal Christianity, a religion of the future. His traditionalism, his historical realism, transforms into an idealism. This transformation makes explicit the nature of the kind of Christian philosophy we're studying, the demand of Christianity, not a truth, but a resistant principle of social organization. First, they persuade themselves there's an intimate union between a dogma and authority from the fact of the papacy. When they perceive that this union is less solid, they thought they'll seek another principle of unity. Traditionalism's true offspring is the positivism of Auguste Comte, who reestablishes all the social values of Catholicism, understanding as social value, the power of unification, without retaining anything of dogma itself. The 18th century, by wrecking Christianity from the intellectual point of view, wrecked its social power. 
for Comte, it's a matter of reestablishing a social power just as strong and an unshakable intellectual base. This endpoint of Joseph de Meist and de Bonald's traditionalism sufficiently proves that in this Christian philosophy, Christianity plays the part of a historical accident. It is ready to cede place to another dogma as soon as the circumstances change. Now we move on to section five. Such is the Christian philosophy of the 19th century is philosophy of the social bond. Let us now see what in, it is in Germany and above all in Hegel's works, a, spe, a speculation on the universe. He declared many times that the Christian religion was an indispensable mo moment in the development of the human mind and the necessary prelude to philosophy. Religion and philosophy have the same content, only religion, quote, has this content in a religious way that is under the form of representation and we must distinguish representation and conceptual thought. Religion is the universal consciousness of spirit in general, and it is then that spirit becomes for the first time the object of a consciousness that is sensible and representative. But it is in philosophy that it exists as a concept, and only philosophy moves itself in this form of thought. This common content is the synthesis or unity of opposites. In the Christian religion, it is presented under the form of Christ the mediator who reconciles man with God. Quote, it has its very beginning in an absolute cleavage, and there is felt need only in cleavage. Therefore, this cleavage of the subject of the ego from the infinite absolute essence drives spirit back into itself. This reconciliation occurs in faith in the form of revelation. It is Christ the Savior who is the reconciler between the existence of man, finite and detached from God by original sin, and the essence of man, which is not different from the infinite. Philosophy only, quote, recognizes this content in liberating from the exclusive form it had in religion and by raising it to the absolute form. That is, if one permits us a somewhat free translation by transforming the Christian myth into an essential law of reality. The Christian myth is the totality of the divine history that goes from creation to the return of God by passing through the original sin that distances man from God and by the redemption that brings him to God again. It becomes the law of the real, since according to the Hegelian dialectic, we see spirit go out from itself and disperse itself in nature in order to return to itself by an inverse movement whose moments are the diverse forms of the life of humanity, consciousness of self, law, mores, morality, religion, and art. There is nothing more habitual to the German mind than such a transformation. Hegel's philosophy is one form, new without a doubt, but a form of the same fundamental thought that had been translated since the Middle Ages by Eckhart and later Jakob Böhme. Nobody more than Hegel had been con convinced that so interpreted the Christian mind marks a very deep scission in the history of humanity. In Christianity, quote, Man is an end by himself. There is an infinite value in him, and he is destined to eternity. He has his fatherland in a supersensible world and in an infinite exteriority that he reaches only by breaking with natural existence and volition and working towards that rupture. In Hellenism, man loses himself in the object of his contemplation. In Christianity, the subject knows itself as such. Quote, in it is the individual, the subject, the welfare of the soul, the salvation of the individual as an individual is the essential purpose. This is the beginning of the movement that leads to absolute spirit. This subjectivity, this selfhood, not selfishness, is precisely the principle of cognition itself. That is how, in this translation, the man-god of Christian dogma is less a historical reality than a symbol of the infinity that human beings find in themselves. But there, Christian philosophy disappears. Just as Joseph de Meist and de Bonald's Christianity ended up in Comte's sociocracy, Hegel's philosophy ends up in that of Feuerbach. From de Meist's Christianity, Comte retains the idea of the social necessity of a dogma that unifies minds. Of Hegelianism, Feuerbach retains the idea of the infinite power that is in humanity and that contains in itself the reason imminent to all its manifestations through history. In both cases, by where it ends up, Christian philosophy has revealed what it was from the beginning, a humanism. In, uh, in both cases, 
One perceives that the Christian religion in what is positive in it does not respond to what this latent humanism demanded of it. It is only a means for it, and this means was found to be imperfect. The end, which is human society and culture, seemed incorrectly embodied by this means, which is abandoned once it is found lacking. This attitude, resigned in some cases or challenging in others, which leaves to the human mind the care for its own destiny, has been the starting point for the last of the forms of Christian philosophy that we have to point out. We know how, by the very analysis of human action grasped by, as such by its imminent characters, uh, Mr. Blondell has tried to draw out a justification of the Christian faith, and more specifically of the Catholic faith, in Axiom 1893. Quote, the time has come, he wrote in 1896, for the truly Catholic idea to show its power and to promote a philosophy which is appropriate to it. It is not then a matter of knowing if philosophy is something existing in itself is in agreement with Christian dogma, but rather of bringing to birth the philosophy of Christianity itself. Still, one must recognize that Mr. Blondell's doctrine is much more of a familial relation with an apologetics than with philosophy. His procedure is well known enough, a critique of action parallel in a certain sense with the critique of knowledge in Kant's work. Kant found himself faced with rationalists such as Leibniz or Descartes, who admitting a perfect adequation between knowledge and its object <clears throat> gave to the human intelligence a divine sufficiency. And he showed that this adequation did take place, but on the condition that this object be an object relative to our modes of knowing and defined by them, whereas knowledge grasped as a whole is inadequate to reality. One can also consider action under two points of view. Speaking technically, an action couldn't correspond exactly to its end and produce precisely what we had wanted it to produce. If one seeks to make all the activities of man fit into technical activities, if one conceives as possible, as Spencer, for example, does, a certain perfection of action that leaves nothing to be desired. But experience shows us that an action never responds to our deep needs, that there is no action that does not bring to birth needs, it does not satisfy provoking other actions, and thus to infinity. Mr. Blondell insists on the feeling of dissatisfaction, of inquietude, on this, quote, state of perpetually unstable equilibrium or of intimate, dis infant, intimate disproportion that always leaves us in quest of something else. In his work, the word action designates not only the known re realization of conscious tendencies, but also obscure virtualities and latent power, implicit anticipations, and confused presentima. He opposes, in short, the true will, which is latent to the apparent and expressed will. And he demonstrates that the objects that satisfy the apparent will do not satisfy our real will. In this endless aspiration, man must make an option. Either he wills to confine himself to what experience supplies him with, and then his will remains unsatisfied and impotent, or he consents to detach himself from objects that cannot satisfy his will, and then it is possible for him to obtain the equilibrium of power and willing. Why not choose the second? Does man pretend to will infinitely without willing the infinite? It is clear the, that the problem of action, as Mr. Blondell raises it, does not have any special relation to Christianity. It very closely resembles the problem of serenity and the tranquility of the soul, which so occupied ancient thought, and for which Stoics, Epicureans, and skeptics had proposed solutions that nothing keeps one from believing just as viable as Mr. Blondell's solution. And this is why we say that it is a matter of apologetics and not philosophy. It is a matter of introducing and defending Christian doctrine considered as proved and verified elsewhere and even of making one desire it. But this convenience is not an argument in its favor. Why should we believe that the reality of things is such that our deep will should be satisfied? Why, should we, why would we believe that it cannot be satisfied except by Christian revelation? It is not there at all that we will find a Christian philosophy. Definitively, then, we have not encountered Christian philosophy, not in St. Augustine, who decisively separates the word made flesh from the reason of the philosophers, nor in St. Thomas, who leaves reason only a precarious existence, nor among the rationalists of the 17th century, whose doctrine tending towards natural religion loses all contact with Christianity, nor with the philosophers of the 19th century, where we see Christian philosophy quickly deflect itself into a humanism. It is by accident 
that during the centuries of the Middle Ages, intellectual culture of Greek origin was closely tied to religious profession. Philosophy at the end of antiquity was Platonist. Aristotle's rationalism dominated the 13th century. In the 17th century, a new intellectualism was born, issued from the Greek genius. In the 19th century, social problems imposed themselves by the antithesis of sociocracy and individualism. This development is independent of Christianity. It did not have the least affinity with it. We have seen Christianity's attempts, always vain, to fix on one of these moments in order to appropriate it, but one can no more speak of a Christian philosophy than of a Christian mathematics or a Christian physics. And that is the end of Brehier's uh, contribution, Is There a Christian Philosophy, published in the Revue de Metaphysique et Morale in 1931, one of his main contributions to the debates. He also took part in the debate itself in the 1931 meeting of the Société Française de Philosophie, but as I've mentioned in the historical introduction to this, summarizing that, he essentially had his ass handed to him by Gilson. Uh, if you like Socratic dialogue where Socrates is taking his interlocutors apart bit by bit, you would probably enjoy reading that. Unfortunately, the Société Française de Philosophie does not allow anything more than the main presentations, and they made an exception for Blondel's letter, which we're going to read in a couple weeks, to be published in translation. But you can trust me on that. If you can get your hands on it, it is quite a discussion that they have back and forth. Um, so that concludes the first real chapter of the translations in um, contained in my nineteen. My, my 2011 book, Reason Fulfilled by Revelation, the 1930s Christian Philosophy Debates in France. I'm happy to take questions about the book, about uh, Emile Brehier, about the other interlocutors, about the points he was making, trying to argue that there, there cannot possibly be a Christian philosophy, particularly when we look at the uh, claimed uh, historical instantiations of it. Um, we will be doing um, two more of these this month, two more readings. I would normally be doing them every Thursday, but I, next Thursday I'm going to be speaking at Stoicon Norway about uh, Stoic stumbling blocks, uh, things that get in the way of beginners studying Stoicism and applying it adequately. So we'll, we, we'll be taking a little hiatus from this, and then we'll be coming back to the, the book um, in the last two Thursdays of the month. Um, any questions, comments, issues people want to ask about, raise, any of those, those sorts of things? While, while people are writing things, if they are going to write things, I, I will mention that Brehier's argumentative strategy is essentially to say, let's look to see whether Christianity made any decisive contributions to philosophy. And he picks out eras, the patristic through Augustine era, um, the time of medieval scholasticism using Thomas Aquinas as the stand-in for that, as we heard today, um, the 17th century rationalism. He doesn't talk about the empiricists because, frankly, he doesn't really care about them too much. Um, and then the 19th century, where we have the traditionalism of people who we don't read anymore, but probably should be because a lot of the people doing traditionalism today are just regurgitating what those, those thinkers I uh, had to say, you know, Lamine, de Bonal, de Meist, um, Hegel, he talks about, and Feuerbach, and then finally uh, goes after Blondel directly. Blondel is going to respond to him in the piece that we're going to read in three weeks from now. Um, Gilson will be the next person up. His um, The Notion of Christian Philosophy, which is a fairly short piece. I think we can get through that in one session. Uh, is there a Christian philosophy? It took us two sessions. Blondell's uh, Does Christian Philosophy Exist as Philosophy? 
um, is a letter that was appended to that in which he's going after Blondell mostly, and then we'll be taking Blondell's Is There a Christian Philosophy? Also in the Revue de Metaphysique, a morale. Um, and that's a response to Brahir. So we have a question. Is the Scottish common sense philosophy ever mentioned by anybody? Not in the debates because they have very little interest in that. And, you know, in the history of philosophy, the Scottish common sense philosophy is sort of a minor school, sort of like the Cambridge Platonists or, you know, um, it is sort of like uh, if you think about he, he so Brahir mentioned Mal Branch, you know, very rarely are people who are um, working on um, 17th century philosophy in Anglo um, countries discussing Malbranche. It's usually Descartes, Leibniz, and, and Spinoza. But Malbranche is equally important. So, yeah, you know, the, the common sense philosophers like Thomas Reed are just not on their, their radar. Um, as a matter of fact, they're not on the radar of most uh, English-speaking philosophers at that time, I would say, as well. Any other questions, comments, um, issues that people want to bring up? All right. Um, Pratham says, don't have any questions or comments. I want to thank you for the works you've put up here on YouTube. You've been a great help to me. Thanks. You're appreciated. Yeah, th well, thanks. I'm, I'm glad that the stuff has been helpful for you. Um, it's been 10 years now, or a little bit more than 10 years. I, I guess you could say I started in spring of 2011. Um, and, you know, I'm going to do at least another decade. We'll see what YouTube turns into. I mean, who knows what the platform will become over the next decade, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's something I, I enjoy doing. It's very helpful for my, my students. Um, you can see, you know, I've got my little studio behind me. It's become part of my way of life and way of doing philosophy. Um, down the line, when I actually have the time, I'll probably start doing some core concept videos on some of the, um, talks in there. Um, all right, here's another question. Is the discussion of infinite desire rooted in any sort of platonic eros, or is there an effort explicitly to distance the Christian position from the ancients? Neither. Um, infinite desire can be understood in many, many different ways. Um, it doesn't have to be rooted in platonic eros. Platonic eros is not the one stand-in for infinite desire in the ancient period. It's just one of, of many different ways of looking at it. Much of platonic eros is not infinite desire, right? You can have Eros um, just for watching horses race or something like that. So there's a lot of different ways to understand desire and inf infinite desire and whether desire is like provoked by the object or whether it's like born within us, you know, all of those, those sorts of things. And it, it frankly is not something discussed thematically all that much in these debates, um, they do reference some authors earlier in the century, like Guy de Broglie, for example, uh, important French uh, Thomist who was, um, you know, digging into this question. There was kind of an open question, is the infinite desire for the infinite something that is natural or supernatural, right? So um, there's, there's that going on. Any other questions, comments, people want to uh, bring up? All right. Well, let me say uh, thanks for the comments and questions and for the attention. Um, book is Reason Fulfilled by Revelation, the 1930s Christian Philosophy Debates in France. Um, available from Catholic University of America Press. Um, it is so far sold, I, you know, in 10 years, about 500 copies, which for an academic book, not too bad. You know, <laughs> um, probably I'm guessing half of those are libraries purchasing it. They, they unfortunately, CUA Press priced it out of a lot of people's price range. If you go above 50 bucks for a book, people don't want to want to get it. Um, it was intended to be a research aid and to help spread, you know, uh, 
what would you call it? Interest and awareness in the how wide the debates were. And it kind of did that, you know. Um, I think I probably need to return to these topics and do a bit more other writing that would be um, popularizing these, these things because it, it's really, you know, well worth studying these documents. The, the idea, the questions, the problems involved with the notion of Christian philosophy, they've really never been debated as thoughtfully and with as many voices and, and as intensively as they were during these 1930s debates. Um, there have been some advances beyond them bringing in things, say, you know, in phenomenology or people talking about, you know, Adrian Pepperzak is a great example of that writing in the 1990s. Um, but they're sort of the touchstone, I would say. And and some of the writers involved in it, like Breyer, great stylist. It's fun to read his stuff, you know, just because it's um, so well put, even though I think he's wrong about stuff. Um, so I'll just leave it at that and say uh, goodbye to everybody. Uh, see you next time. And uh, thanks for the conversation.